scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. There is a dimension of faith that is expressed in land. That is why when people give their lands to demons, when they give their lands to strangers, they are destroying the purposes of God over their life. It is true. Kings in ancient times showed the extent of their dominions by the land they will conquer and then establish something that represents them. Please do not forget these four things. I'm not teaching on dominion now. We'll do that hopefully maybe later in the evening when we are talking about the mystery of the ark. I want to show you how we triumph over battles and the vicissitudes of life by understanding the mystery of of the ark you will know why the nation of israel as heavy as that thing was they could enjoy it let it go with us to battle we will never go to battle without it hallelujah they would rather forget their swords and their weapons than to forget the ark but today we remember our checkbooks we remember everything but the ark leave that for evening praise the name of the lord look at this the earth, the fullness, the system, the inhabitants. If Enugu is to call upon the name of the Lord, these are the four things that the intercessors must pray about. These are the four things that the captains of industry must pursue. The earth must say Jesus is Lord. The fullness must say Jesus is Lord. The system must be designed to honor that Lord. And the inhabitants must call upon the name of the Lord. When this happens, the kingdom has come. Let's get back to our teaching. Is someone learning something this morning? At least we have established the foundation yesterday. So I know that our hearts are right now. We can discuss these truths. When Jesus went to hell and defeated Satan, he resurrected and then... He ascended that coronation when it happened. He now returned back to earth. When he returned back to earth, listen carefully. He went and saw the timid disciples who were hiding and he appeared unto them and said, All hail. Something just happened to me. All authority, exousia, in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. He says, Go therefore. I send you with this same backing. Is that true? Now, please listen to me. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be a partaker of God's divine nature? Because many times we do not understand, even as preachers, we do a lot of altar calls and those who give their life, they just clap. And all they think, the only thing they can relate to their experience is that I've escaped hell, which is true, but not sufficient for victory. What really happened? The Bible lets us know, according to the Pauline epistle, that at the point of the new birth, among the many things that happen, number one, that there is a translation from the kingdom of darkness. There is a switching of kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Number two, there is an exchange of dominion of the laws that are at work in that man's life. Galatians, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, there is therefore now no more condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Why? For the law of sin and death, is that true? Hath set me free. Or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So there is something called the law of sin and death. Everybody who is not saved, no matter how confident they sound, no matter how free they sound, according to the authority of scripture, that law is at work in them. So when people are saved, as simple as it sounds, as simple as they look, they may be laughing while they are saying it. It does not negate the truth of scripture. There is a translation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. Number two, the administration of righteousness. You cannot receive eternal life, the life of God. So wait until you have righteousness equal to that of Jesus. And the Bible already tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So... By believing that report, you receive the blessing of Abraham, justification by faith. Now that righteousness is imparted, imputed to you. And you can receive the way, the life of God. Can I tell you this? The life of God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not bring the life of God. He is the life of God. There is no record in scripture where the Holy Spirit is carrying any other object and bringing it to a man. His very presence is the life of God. The Holy Spirit is the representation of the life of God in man. You are spiritually dead until he comes. The manifestation of God in man. Now, even though when you pray, you don't pray to the Holy Spirit for salvation. It is the office of the Christ that is responsible for everything that has to do with redemption. But the personality that lives in you, in honor to that prayer, is the Holy Spirit. Are we together now? Yes. Jesus Christ is in your heart today, you are right. But theologically speaking, Jesus as a person... The man, Jesus, is seated at the right hand of the Father. It is the Holy Spirit who represents an extension of His presence in your life. Physically, bodily, and even spiritually. Because the Bible says it's not only your spirit, even your body is His temple. So when you want to host God, you don't just host God in a building like this yet. It is that building, that temple of your body this is very powerful the holy spirit does not just live in our spirit even this physical body can host him is someone learning something for the purpose of our discussion my goodness there are two principal implications to having the divine life number one when you have the divine life which is the life of God, which is the Holy Spirit, you must be aware of two things. Number one, you must be aware that you have been made by that divine life one with Christ. Please, everybody say, I am one with Christ. Very simple teaching, but it is very powerful. The reality of our oneness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, from verse 7. Please, let's look at it. We're about to pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 7. Did I get that right? Oh dear. Please help me. There's a scripture that I'm looking for. We have been made one with Christ. Give me Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. No, no, no. Not, not 1 Corinthians 12. Just go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, and you as he quickened, we'll do a bit of reading, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh huh. Wherein in time past you walk according to this world. Listen, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh. Uh huh. That means the sons of disobedience are not just disobedient, they are one with a the spirit. There is a spirit that makes this happen to them. Next verse, verse 3. 
It says, among whom you had your conversation in time past, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, who were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Next verse, hallelujah. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, uh -huh, even when we were dead in sin, had quickened us together. Everybody say together. The key word here is together. Verse, verse 6 now. And had raised us up together. Everybody say together. Your oneness with Christ. Your oneness with Christ. We see the same expression in John chapter 15. One of the keys Jesus was talking about being divine and he ties it to our oneness with Christ. Is it alright if we read it? The first eight verses, let's do it very quickly. I am the vine, ye and my father is the husband man. Uh -huh. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth that it may bring more fruit. Three, now ye are clean through the words which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me powerful instruction it says i am the vine and ye are the branches he that abided in me the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing for without me, if a man abided not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into fire and they are burnt. Uh -huh. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. Because I trust what you are asking because you are abiding in me. If you are not abiding in me, I do not trust what you are asking. What then becomes the motivation for your asking? Are we together now? Being one with Christ. Being one. The reality of your oneness. I am inseparable. Man of God, listen to me. You are not just a human body who was once a baby. Something happened to you when you gave your life to Christ. You are one with Christ. It's the principle of a salt covenant. It's a way of binding relationships that do not break easily. That means everybody was an ancient practice. Everybody will bring their salt together. And once you pour your salt, I pour my salt, we mix it together. The condition for the relationship to break is everybody must look for their salt and pick it out. I'm no longer a slave to feed. I am a child. Oneness with Christ. You are not just a Christian. You are one with Christ. It is true. The Bible lets us know that when the Holy Spirit came, He did not just come to confirm that you have life now. He came to represent the presence of God. Never will you walk alone. Never will you walk alone. That abiding presence is with you. You walk conscious of that presence. When you are laying hands, you know that it's, it's not only your hands that is on someone's head. When you are preaching, it's not only your voice. Their physical ears may be hearing your voice, but their spiritual ears are hearing the voice of the one backing you. Jesus himself showed us that the secret to his excelling when he walked on the earth, he said, I can of my own do nothing. Jesus showed us the consciousness of his oneness with Christ. It has blessed me in life and in ministry. Can I tell you this? Sometimes you look at mountains that stand before you in ministry and you're wondering, how do I start? Where do I go? But I remember, I'm not alone. Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit who was with him will be with us and in us. There are many things Joshua Selman cannot do. But not when the Holy Spirit is there. The abiding presence of God. I learned this from Benny Hinn. The abiding presence of God. Men like E.W., men like um, Toza, they wrote a book on practicing the presence of God and how to cultivate that consciousness. It is already a reality, but it may not find expression in your life until the consciousness is at work in your mind. I am not alone. Someone shouted, say, I'm not alone.
Me and the Holy Spirit cannot fail together. I agree that I can fail. But me and the Holy Spirit cannot fail together. This is not just a Pentecostal talk. I really believe it with all my heart. Me and the Holy Spirit cannot fail together. You carry this mentality to ministry, carry this mentality to church, carry this mentality to business. Me and the Holy Spirit cannot fail together. Man of God, when you know this, you will know that there are no gimmicks to ministry. Ministry will thrive. And if they ask you why, you don't just say because I'm intelligent. I am conscious of this one, this paraclet of God who represents the life of God in me. Otherwise, how in the world do you believe that you're going to stand before someone who tells you, I have been bound for 30 years, and you believe in one meeting, you can look at him and say, go free. What arrogance without the Holy Spirit. By what authority? A man has been bound for 30 years, and you show up and look at him and say, go. I stand in part. When you tell, you see, when I look at you and I say, you are free, the weed there, the me who is telling you, you are free, is not Joshua Selman alone. Joshua Selman in partnership with the life of God. Hi, my goodness. I'm praying for you that you believe what I'm telling you. When you believe this, you will be a marvelous blessing. Listen, anyone just come, let me use you as an example. Do you know, if you believe you have this life, all this good morning that you are shaking people anyhow and nothing is happening to them, you will shake someone, God bless you. You know, you know what you just said? And yet the person's life did not change. If you enter the house of a herbalist and say, sorry, this was not where I wanted to go. Do you know just for entering, your life would not be the same. Like you were looking for a neighbor's house and you entered into a shrine and said, sorry sir, I didn't even know this was a shrine. He will tell you bye bye and pity you because you are coming back. He knows that your life will, just that you entered into a place. And yet, we believe we are carrying the Holy Spirit. And we keep telling people, bless you. Good morning. You lay your hands on their documents. You do everything and nothing changes. And men of God, we embrace people after service. And they say, sir, nothing is changing. Can I tell you this? Help me. The commodity we give people is not oil. What we give people... Is, I'm not saying those things are wrong. The real thing you give people is a transference of that divine life. That's what you give people. The divine life that you have is transferable. More than just power or anointing or bottle. You are not a man of God just because you are speaking. Even when you are silent. You are still a man of God. Ten years, doors have not been opened. Okay, I'm going for a meeting now. God bless you. He touched you. He touched God. It is true. He did not just touch a body of his pastor. He made contact with heaven. And you tell him, go. This gentleman will go. And what refused to run away from him sees two people coming. Not just one person again. The yokes, they didn't run away because they saw only one person from that family. But now because you made contact. Listen, this is why I'm, I don't feel bad. This is a pastor's meeting. Honestly, it should be an embarrassment for people to be in a church for a long time. And nothing is happening to them. No. 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 Even though I'm giving an example, if this man's life remains the same, I will go for a retreat. I'm telling you. Sorry. If this man's life actually remains the same, it's not pride. I'm giving you an understanding. It's not the oil that comes on you on ordination day, it's the revelation. God dwells in a man. 
I was not born like this. Your parents may still be alive, but my goodness is the mystery of godliness. This is how to be a blessing. You are not a blessing just when you give people money or donation or something. That's wonderful. But the superior way to be a blessing is get God to people. When they are flying you for a program, they are not just bringing a man. When people honor you, they are not just honoring a body. They are honoring the presence. It's like the ark of God. You have come. I truly believe what I'm telling you with all my heart. I really believe it. When I understood this, help them. I made a covenant with God that I will never, nobody will meet me twice to be changed. No. You can meet me to keep growing, to keep getting blessed. But if you meet me, you, it's impossible for your life to remain the same. Many of us have been preachers for a long time. We keep preaching and nothing is happening. You are sincere, but that consciousness has not released the reality of the life of God within you. I'm not talking of boastful carrying yourself up. That is not where power comes from. It comes from a sincere revelation. Nobody will ever look at you as a cause to them. How, in what way are you a cause? So when someone says, Pastor, come to my shop, just come and drink minerals. The person is wise. He knows what he's doing. He's not bringing a man's hand to hold a bottle of um, uh, malt or whatever it is. He's saying, if there is a way, let me be obed Edom. Please, act, come. come. Now, can I tell you this sincerely? Preachers, we come but we just go as men of God. And we go there and nothing happens. Their lives remain the same. Look at Jesus. He walked as the living presence of God. You don't have to act superhuman. You are superhuman. Can I tell you this? I don't mean, please don't feel bad. I'm not, I'm not insulting you and, and I'm, not, I'm not, I know people are following all over the world. But only God can tell the number of patients, the number of sick people, the number of communicable diseases by reason of the kind of ministry God has given me that I've contacted all my life. If I were lying about the divine life, believe me, I would have died by now. I have prayed for people that I have been warned. Be careful. Be careful. I command that spirit to leave that gentleman now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please pay attention. Listen to what I'm telling you. John G. Lake understood this in Spokane. He understood it. Believers in this end time, if we don't pay attention, our churches will become empty. If we cannot bring the reality of God to people. People are tired of stories. They want to see the reality of the, the reality of the life of God. I am one with God. One with God. One with God. Let me tell you something that happened in my house. I was expecting a visitor and the person came which maybe it was for someone to pray for and it was a family. And then when they came... I sat at the parlor and they had told me they, had, they were coming and I was expecting them to have opened the door. And for some minutes, the door was not open. And I, hope, I was hoping everything was alright. And I was hearing, it was like someone was hitting the I said, it can't be the dog. I went and opened the door and there were the people on the floor just trying to open the door. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying that, you see, when you carry God... You are not the only one who should know. If you are the only one who knows that you carry God, something is wrong with what you are carrying. Listen, women, do you cook anywhere in the house? No, there is a kitchen. But if it's a serious meal, you know what I'm talking about. 
Anybody in that house should suspect you are cooking something. The fragrance from the kitchen, no matter where you are, it has a way of going to the living room. You can suspect what is in the kitchen without going there. Can I tell you this? When Moses encountered the face of God, the people did not need to climb up again to see God. They just needed to look at the man who had seen God to see God. Reject this natural living. This common sense living. There is nothing wrong with your mind. But there is a superior dimension of living. You cannot excel doing end time ministry. Just acting like a counselor. You need more than that. You need to act like a genuine solution. And it is in your oneness with God. How do you know the sick will be healed? How do you know life will change? You don't wait until they testify to be sure they were blessed. You can know they were blessed. Ah, this is what Jesus taught the disciples. And when Peter and John looked at the man, he said, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have. There is something. We do not see any physical thing being given. I have life. The life of God is transferable. Such as I have, give I unto you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let me pray for someone here. Whatever has kept you ordinary in your Christian life, that you are unable to walk in the reality of your divine life, I pray, let fire from heaven right now bring an activation to that divine life. Begin to walk in the reality of that dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ, begin to walk in the reality of that dimension. Hallelujah. Listen, I remember one time I was told the story that Archbishop Benson Idahosa, someone who I think his face was deformed, and he was in a hurry and they brought the person. And he lifted the face to heaven. He said, God, this man was made in your image. If this is how you look, leave him like that. Your Bible that you have kept in your room, that we preach with every Sunday, is full of wonders here ordinary men these are not parables men who walked upon the face of the earth like gods not in pride but in confidence i'm not alone god is with me there is an advantage my oneness with christ listen to me there are people who, are, who have been respected in this nation because of those they know not because of who they are i saw that photo you mean you and this man? Yes, by the privilege of God's mercy. You were with him? That photo was not photoshopped? Yes, I was with him. All of a sudden, your perceptions about you change. You ate with this billionaire. You were in his house? Yes, I was there. And then matters become worse if the person's call comes while they are talking. He's still the same person calling me. Ah, that oneness is settled. What if while you are talking about Jesus, he shows up too? What if while you are telling the sick, he heals, he comes to heal them? What if while you are telling the oppressed, he delivers, he comes to deliver them? What if you are telling the poor that he can lift, he comes to lift them? Help this woman, please. I question your relationship. When the one who loves you does not show up in defense. I question your relationship. Watch this. Sir, when you were honoring the first lady, even though she's not here, but while they saw the picture, everyone was celebrating her. Probably she may be following, listening now, and feeling very happy. She's not here physically speaking. But her relationship with you was preserved and the honor accorded that relationship was still communicated. 
It is not because you cannot see Jesus that shame has come to you. It is because there is something. Your pastor taught you something this morning. Look how we talk about him. We sing about him. We claim we are one with him. We cry and we call him. Lord, come and change lives. Lord, come and bless people. And then at the end of it, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, Amen. I'm not talking about falling down. No. I hope you know that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that someone who comes to service insulting God and insulting men of God by the time the fire from the worship comes the man of God has not even come up because those who are worshipping know that they are not musicians they are acts they are priests the opening of their mouth they are not singing special numbers they are communicating life as they hold that mic it does not matter whether the person is leading or backing up it doesn't matter presence is presence That someone who came to church broken one song when the instrumentalists know that they are not just playing instruments, they are releasing life through the instruments. Everything in the church should worship, everything in the church should release the presence of God. When the ushers, please help me with one envelope. One, if the ushers are passing, thank you, sir. If the ushers are passing this, I know it's time for offering. But because my hand touched it. Backing the pastor up while he ministers to you. Someone can just hold it and know what happened. Something happened. Who is this usher? You just passed an offering envelope. No, you passed your secret place with you too. Listen, this is how workers should be trained. You are not just workers or staff. You are priests. You are acts first. Can I tell you this? You return back home and gather your children and say, listen, you are not just young teenagers in this house. Let me teach you something. You are representations of heaven. You carry the presence of God. The very Shekinah of God. The Bible says, this is the record that God, so we know where it came from. God had given us the way eternal life the life of god and he said this life is in his son whosoever has the son has that life i have the life i have the life i really do i have the life it's an indestructible life it's a life of grace and power and effulgence of heaven in and through your life not by arrogance and boasting but by a sincere communication of this reality, it is true. I walk with this consciousness. I'm not only anointed when I dress for a service. Anytime you meet me, even when I'm joking, the anointing is there. If there is ever a need in your life, that anointing will meet that need even while we are joking. Can I tell you this? Nobody should come near your life and go back the same again from today. Nobody. Nobody. Some of you with this consciousness, you can run back to your homes and say, Mama, there is a conference ongoing. I know you are coming in the evening, but right now, let me show you what I've learned. Bring your hands, let's pray. And you hold Mama's hand, and as you are holding the hand, the phone is ringing. And he says, I've been trying to reach this family for five years. Send me an account number. And your mother said, what has happened? I brought the presence of God. Can I tell you this? Please look up. When you know this, you will not let society try to make you relevant by doing things and compromising. You have to do a certain thing to be... No, you have been accepted in the beloved. The highest and the noblest position on earth is being one with Christ. The only other position higher than it is being a monarch or the position after it is being a monarch. 
Please help that person. Our time is up. We must respect the time. Wherever it is, we can touch. I, I, I apologize. But let me, please sit down. Let me just jump this. Can I just share with you in the next five minutes, three Three areas that every leader and every man of God must excel in in this end time. These are three areas that Satan is prepared to attack in this end time. Number one, the first area where the devil wants to attack in the life of ministers, in the life of a church, is in the area of church growth. Please pay attention. The area of church growth. Can I tell you this? Satan hates men coming together to call upon the name of the Lord. If you're a minister of the gospel, please hear this. The moment you name the name of Christ and God has a portion, an assembly or a people, whether you like it or not, you are a principal subject of attack. Because there is nothing more frustrating for a man of God than to be sincerely called and anointed. But then, the people who should hear what God has told you to say are not there. One of the indices that measure the health of a man of God and the health of his assignment in ministry is that there must be people who come to hear what the Lord has told you to say. It is proof that he sent you. If God is the one who sent you and there is nobody placing a demand on that call, Something is wrong. Mark chapter 1. Let's look at the ministry of Jesus. A few minutes and I'm done. I apologize for the time. Mark chapter 1. I tell you, my spirit is fired up this morning. I came to challenge you. Let me cut a few verses because of time. I would have wanted us to read everything. But Mark chapter 1, 2, 3 is an expression of the ministry of Jesus. Let's start from verse 21 for the sake of time. Mark chapter 1. This is in Capernaum. Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you, sir. I've been given a few more minutes. Can you celebrate your pastor for me? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Left for me, you will remain here. Let me tell you sincerely. I have, I have the grace you will remain here till. Do you know this is how in the 60s and 70s, the, the revival fire, this was how Papa Hagen and these people, they would sit down every day for 30 days, 60 days. You would eat there and keep the plate there and continue the teaching. The earlier, I'm not saying we'll do that, of course, times have changed. The early apostles would teach till someone would sleep and fall down and die. They would raise the person back and continue the teaching. Let me use the time I was given. And they went into Capernaum. Please look up. And straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Hmm. And they were astonished at his doctrine. So we know that Jesus taught and we know what he taught. Doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina. It means a body of truth allocated to make you become something exact. Doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in that synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. We know down that there are two kinds of spirits. Clean spirits and unclean or demonic spirits. And he cried out, saying let us alone that means there was an effect in his message he preached and there were many audiences not just men or many audience that were listening it was not just men spirits too were following the message and one said no i have to cry out this message is too hot is your message hot enough to penetrate from the earth realm into the realm of the spirit you are sharing and you're teaching and something is happening right from the realm of the spirit. People are being delivered. Chains are breaking. Because what you are teaching 
is truth. Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee whom thou art the Holy One of God. Uh -huh. Jesus rebuked him saying, hold your peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had told him, he cried with a loud voice and then it came out of him. Next verse. The Bible says they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even unclean spirits and they do obey him. Look how powerful this is. What happened? Immediately. Not two weeks later. Not three weeks later. There is a way God spreads his influence across a territory. There are things that must be done and the results can be immediately. Immediately, his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. We are still reading. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Uh-huh. And Simon's wife's mother lay sick of fever. And anon they tell him of her. This is Jesus now. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately, we see that word again. Immediately. The fever. So fever is not a Nigerian issue. It's not an African. It's been there for a long time. And Jesus did something about it. That means the church can do something about it. The Bible says... And when it was evening and the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, possessed with devils, next verse, and the city. The city. You see how we take cities. And the city was gathered together at the door. What were they coming to do? To bear witness, to see. Jesus taught. He ministered with life. There were sick bodies that testified. There were miracles and signs and wonders that came in attestation to the truthfulness of what he was teaching. As a result, his fame went round. The whole city came back. The Bible now says... That the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many. Please pay attention. That were sick of diverse diseases. And cast out many devils. Suffered not the devils to speak. Because they knew him. Uh -huh. And in the morning. Now look at him. With all these fearful results. Rising up a great while before day. He went out and departed into a solitary place you are seeing the key to church growth here the key to excelling in ministry it tells us his public life it also tells us his private life he went out to pray he departed to a solitary place and there he prayed next verse the bible says and simon and they that were with him did what followed after him you know you are producing results because you never walk alone there must be someone following you as a witness to the fact that the hand of God is upon you. And when they had found him, may this be someone's testimony. Please read with me. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men. How many men? All men means professionals, laymen, intellectuals, all age ranges. All races, all men seek for thee. This is what Satan does not want to see. Beloved co laborers in the gospel, let me encourage you. Our world has become so harsh over the things of God. There seem to be so many options right now. And many men of God are under pressure. It's like they are under pressure in defense of the call of God upon their lives. Can I tell you? There are principles that when you walk with, there is no shame for you as far as the people who will come to attend to what God has told you. We are not the first to start this. The Bible says where the carcasses are, it says there the eagles will gather. I came in yesterday and the airport, your airport was so busy. I saw private jets everywhere. 
and people had come because I was told that there are governors who came in for a meeting and I saw other people who were there there were those freelancing around there were those who came to dance to greet them and I said can you imagine every time there is something worth the attention of people they will give attention to it if people ignore you and ignore your church they are simply telling you something you should pay attention to Guess what they are saying. I may not be in doubt as to the fact that God called you. But I need to see the evidence that parallels that which happened in the life of Jesus. I need to see you preach the gospel with power. This is the key to church growth. I need to see you teach the word with authority. I need to see a demonstration of the reality of the efficacy of the truths that you are teaching. Through the healings, through the miracles, but more importantly, through the transformation of the mind of the listeners. People should sit down under you and on listening to you, there should be that transition in their lives. The greatest miracle is not just physical healing. Believe me, the greatest miracle secondary only to salvation is transformation. No matter who is healed, no matter who is delivered, if their minds are not right, their lives will remain wrong. This was the miracle that happened to the madman in Gadara. When he was healed, he came and sat with Jesus and the Bible says, the other people came and they met him seated in his right mind. Men can come but be in their wrong minds. And you know the law is that everything that follows you is a report card to what you believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. That means the way to drive what is following you is not to tell it go away. Change what you believe and what is following you will change. Everything that follows you is a report card. It's an attestation to what you believe. If failure, defeat is following you if weakness and mediocrity is following you they are not following you they are following your mindset and they've been mandated to honor that mindset you will drive them they will come back because they were instructed to be obedient so the way you drive these negative things is the teaching the accurate communication can I tell you this? The primary assignment of a shepherd to his congregation, according to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, I will give you shepherds after my heart, and that they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That is the assignment of a shepherd. If you are after the heart of God as a pastor, as a shepherd, you must laboriously go through scripture and communicate doctrine. Doctrine that sustains the power to transform people. So an ordinary person just comes as a new convert. Comes out, receives the card. I should come back after one year and meet that person. Walking, serving the Lord. And I look at the person, I say, how are you? I remember you. And he says, I remember you too. So tell me, what have you learned? Can I tell you this sincerely? Men and women of God, let's challenge ourselves. Can I call five people, not here, generally speaking. Can you go to any assembly and call five people at random? Ask them to stand and examine them on the major doctrines of scripture. You've been how long in this church or this ministry? I've been here three years. Tell me what you know about prayer. Tell me what you know about redemption and righteousness. Tell me what you know about kingdom service. Tell me what you know about character. Tell me what you know about love and passion for the kingdom. Can I be sincere with you? If we are to be honest in the name of the Lord, this, in this, this, this conference this morning, for many people, at best, if people really pass that test, it may be two over five. Something is wrong with the content of what we are teaching. Something is wrong with how we are teaching. Believers are not getting matured and they are not satisfied with what is happening. Remember, I'm teaching apostolically. I'm teaching the body of Christ. So you understand. We must examine what we are teaching. It is the word that makes men mighty. And if the word that is coming from our pulpit, if the word is weak, the people will be an expression of that weak word. Look how Jesus transformed ordinary men. Look at the ratio of impartation to teaching. Three years to one night. This is how Jesus mentored people. We have switched it over. 
And I thank God because God has granted me the grace to walk in all these things. But I tell you, when it is time for the word, you sit down. When you fall, you stand up and carry your barrel and keep writing. The ratio of impartation to teaching, according to the ministry of Jesus, was three years to one night. But now we have flipped it over. It is impartation three years and teaching one night. How will people be? You see, people cannot grow. So you have a lot of immature people carrying anointing around. And they don't know what to do with it because the doctrine that brings stability is not there. Please, I hope you are not offended. Forgive me, huh? If we really want to bring the church that brings glory to the name of the Lord, Miracles don't mature believers. They only help their conviction. What matures believers is the accurate exegesis of doctrine. When believers are soundly mentored, methodically, they are taught the ways of God. Miracles are supposed to come after doctrine has been communicated. Then the people now see the validity. Now, I have taught you that God prospers. I have also taught you the purpose of kingdom prosperity. Now, the grace that empowers can come upon you. And it will now profit you and profit the house. But if all you receive is just an impartation for prosperity, that money will come and it will kill you. And it will not kill only you. It will kill many people in that church too. You see what, what happens? We win a lot of souls and when they come, they reappear and they come back. They are not occupying any position but they are freelancing around. And so Satan can easily find them. Discipleship is a name given to the system that brings maturity in believers. We must restore genuine discipleship. Nobody in any assembly should outgrow being mentored. Nobody in any assembly should outgrow being taught. There are no exceptions. Doctrine is for all. This is what our fathers taught us. That is the reason why their works last. We have laughed at some of them, maybe because they didn't work in miracles as much, but there is stability. Some of the people who got born again under their ministry, you see your pastor here telling you he got born again. Here is the man who God used to bring him. And after how many years he's still standing? Go and find out the average harvest from our crusades. After two weeks, they are back almost worse than it was before. This is an attack that Satan is bringing on the end time church. I ask you to spare me a few minutes because I believe in my heart that this will be the opportunity to share this. Can I tell you this? When we get to the crusade ground, we don't talk too much because we are constrained with time. We just share the love of Jesus and allow the miracles come to, to prove that Jesus is Lord. And by that miracle and by the show of love and by the communication of the gospel, many come to Jesus. But when these people become saved and they now become part of the fold, there is no rushing with mentorship. Can I be sincere with you? There is a difference between teaching in a conference and building people. In a conference, you have one week or three days. I'm here right now. I'm trying to just teach everything in two minutes. But when I'm building my people, I'm not in a rush. They are here with me till Jesus comes. I will teach them methodically. Men of God, let's be careful. This pressure to bring Rema is why many people don't settle down to administer doctrine. There is a pressure among men of God. What are you repeating this faith thing again? I thought you did it in January. You teach it for as long as it needs to be taught. What you should be after is not just newness, but freshness. Freshness. Are you learning? This is how our... The body of truth that makes for the maturity of the believers is finite. You exhaust them and come back again. You exhaust them and come back again. Until it becomes the things that are most surely believed among us. There are fathers in this nation who have been saying the same thing for many years. They said it until we believed it after 10 years. If they had stopped at 9 years, we would not get it. 
when you go to Kenneth Higgins or Kenneth Copeland, in every ten words you are going to hear the word faith or believe or word of God. They have been teaching this. They laughed at them and most of the people who laughed at them have died and gone. And they are still standing. You want church growth? Except we want to keep doing these gimmicks that people do. I, I, I love the body of Christ. And I'm not teaching from a standpoint of sarcasm. I have an apostolic call. You see, body of Christ, the alternative to this authentic principle of maturing believers is to play a lot of these things that we keep seeing around that is not bringing glory to the name of the Lord. Manipulation becomes the only other alternative. But God is changing someone here in the name of Jesus. What then is the principle of church growth? There are many, but basically, the key that brings people, hear me, the gospel must be preached. To preach means to declare. It means to proclaim. What is the gospel? The gospel is a revelation of the Father's love, demonstrated in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Man being the object of that love alongside creation, to the intent that if we believe we are saved, it must be taught. We should not forget this. There are people who have not made altar calls in many assemblies in a long time. I don't say this out of sarcasm, but without altar calls, men will not be saved. And if men are not saved, Satan will find them. And when he finds them, he will use them and use them against the church. The work of an evangelist is not for evangelists. The work of an evangelist is for everybody who truly loves Jesus. So in all our conferences, our conventions, our church meetings, please, I beseech you by the mercies of God, we must give room for sinners to find Jesus. Win yourself from the embarrassment of saying, I made an altar call three weeks straight. Nobody came. So what? Do you cry when you open your shop and for three hours nobody has come? The fourth person that can come can buy everything in that shop. You must carry that mentality. Could it be that after three weeks of nobody coming out for altar call, by the next week, the person who comes will become the next resident pastor of that church in the next ten years? What if Billy Graham was not saved? What if Baba Deboye was not saved? What if Bishop Oyedeko was not saved? What if Pastor Paula Defarasson was not saved? What if Papa Kumuyi was not saved? What if these men were not saved? Think of the myriad of salvation that were in them at the point they were making the altar call. I know what I'm sharing is old school, but that's why it's powerful. It has been tested for a very long time. I am both new school and old school, oh, depending on which one. Yes. When it has to do with the gospel, don't change it. Don't remove that ancient landmark. Let pe Can I tell you something with people sincerely? I tell you this by God. Members are not stupid people. They will gauge the pastor and gauge your level of spiritual seriousness. If they, they have their A rating, A plus, they have A minus, they have B, they have C, the next one is F. They look at you. When they find out that this man is there for my spiritual growth, they know where to stay when they really want to grow. When they want to enjoy themselves, they know where to stay. When they are backsliding and they don't want interruption, they know where to stay. May your church be where people stay when they really need God. Church growth. Please sit down. And let me say this. Don't be careful so that you don't join some of these ignorant statements that said it's not all about crowd, it's not all about people. Be careful. Without the people, what are we doing? God so loved the people and, and we are talking about where should the people be? Can I tell you, the more a society has people in the house of God, the more they can hear the truth. The church is the only institution that has the authorized manual for transforming society. The parliament only has part. The law court only has part. Only the church has the authorized the, the manual for transforming men. 
The court cannot save men. It can arrest, it can prosecute. The parliament can pass policies. Does a parliament cast demons? Does a parliament heal the sick? Does a bank raise the dead? This is why Satan is isolating the church to fight the church. And one of the ways the devil is fighting the church is to make sure that membership starts declining. Thank God for online. Thank God for those wonderful things, the, the reach of the internet. But can I tell you this? If you are a man of God, pray that God will bring people and not a few. I am telling you this. If the space is there, push the building, open it, expand it. The building is not, it didn't come from heaven, it was man-made. Break that building and open it and give God space. For as long as there is one sinner still left in Enugu, there is one more person who loves Jesus. Let them find their way to the church. I came and I saw many overflows here. I said, may God bless the man of God. Because you expect that more people will come. Please hear what I'm telling you. If we do not take the issue of souls and church, may God forbid it that a season will come in Enugu when the mo most of the people in this place don't go to church. That would be terrible. This was the mistake the West made. They made this mistake 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now all those young boys who did not go to church are now the leaders. And they are only doing what they know. Yes, we were not raised to honor God. Don't come here and come and talk to us about God. Every generation respects what they agree with. If they didn't grow with God as part of their mind control system, don't assume that they will later just come. Train up a child, he says. A child there does not just mean the one you gave birth to physically. Train up a spiritual child in the way he should grow. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. May House on the Rock keep expanding in the name of Jesus Christ. May House on the Rock in Enugu continue to find many who come to Jesus. It is called a house that is on a rock. That even at these times of turbulence, it is my prayer that all across the length and the breadth of Enugu, that the angels that gather the harvest, that they will bring people from everywhere. In the name of Jesus Christ. And for every other church that is represented in this land, please be intentional and go after souls. Look at me. I don't mean to offend you, but let me tell you where souls are. There is a place they are. Souls are not just in another man's church. Souls are in the beer parlor. You must go there. Souls are in many, many places that need the power of God. Do not just move and want to bring people and bring people who are already matured and processed. Bring people and start from the beginning. He said, go to the byways. Compel them to come and be ready to build them. A good leader does not just make followers. Listen to me carefully. A good leader transforms followers into leaders like your pastor has done. And then he makes those leaders agents of change. This is what Dr. Miles Monroe taught us. An attack on church growth. Number two. I may not have the time to teach it. I'm sorry. The second thing, I'm preaching this from the depth of my heart because I share the burden of your man of God. I know that he organized this conference and especially this session. Because many of you have been praying as to why things are not working. In this end time, can I be sincere with you? If you are not about souls, if you are not about revealing Jesus, if you are not about teaching doctrine, if you are not about discipleship, be ready for empty pews. Be ready for empty pews. I vowed a vow under God, sir, that I will never gather the people of God to come and waste their time from morning. See, people come six hours, seven hours before church starts and they sit down waiting patiently and ministry starts and I waste people's time. No, the ones who taught us and mentored us did not teach us to waste people's time. They taught us to carry the responsibility of a visionary whilst you are teaching people. 
It doesn't matter whether it's at a house cell level. It doesn't matter whether it's at a, a departmental level. It doesn't matter whether it's within the larger house. There must be seriousness and intention given to everything that is being done. The next attack is on the supernatural. Signs and wonders. Satan is gradually, gradually bringing believers. John chapter 4 and verse 40. Let's look at 29 and then we'll go to 48. John 4, 29, then we'll go to 48. Satan is fighting the supernatural in the church. Let me tell you sincerely. Let me tell you sincerely. If we throw away the supernatural, this was the story between the woman at the well. Remember, the woman with five husbands who had the sixth one while she was talking with Jesus. The Bible says after she encountered Jesus, she ran. What did she say? Come see a man who told me the things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Next verse, very quickly. Next verse, 30. The Bible says they went out of the city and came to him. Why? Because of the impact of what happened to her. She was a popular woman whose problem was known by all. As soon as Jesus solved her problem, she was too grateful to keep quiet. 31. In the meanwhile, the disciples were praying and they said, Master, eat. And he said to them, I have meat that you do not know anything about. Next verse. The disciples said to one, has anyone brought this that he has eaten? And he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish. Uh -huh. You know, he said this, are there not four months? Let's go to what, what's the next um, 48 for the sake of time. Just go straight to verse 48. Jesus said, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Except ye see signs and wonders. Can I tell you this? People of God, do not keep quiet with the marvelous things God is doing in the life of people. Let the city know that God healed people. Not exaggerated testimonies, not lies. Genuine miracles that happen. If you keep quiet, you are shorting the manifestation of the glory of God. Testimonies are powerful tools that glorify the name of the Lord. The Bible did not keep quiet over the things that Jesus did. In fact, here's what it says in John chapter 20. It says, many miracles did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded that you might believe, and that in believing, you will have eternal life. Testimonies are more than just an attestation that a man is anointed. You are letting people know that Jesus is alive. We have to keep bombarding the streets of Enugu with what Jesus is doing. So that when people sit eating outside, their discussion is, did you hear what God did? We hear that a madman just entered during the service in House on the Rock. And without even prayer, it was even the usher receiving him. That madness just disappeared. And that now the person has become a chief usher. While they are talking about it, another person says, oh, that is even an old story. Come and hear about a woman who for eight years, she's not had a child. Just last week, she gave birth to triplets. And someone says, last week is too late. Let me tell you the one that happened yesterday. That a whole family that had HIV, from father to last born, all of them went for a test and nothing happened. Can I tell you this? There is something about human beings and there is something about Africans. They always go to where the news is happening. Even if to verify. They say, no, I have to come and find out. What did you say? The Lord is lifting people. I hear that everyone who comes to that church in less than two weeks is having a job. It's, I don't believe it, but let me come. They are still welcome. Because when that, God knows how to prepare for those kind of people. Because their testimonies will be more powerful. They doubted openly. So when they acknowledge openly. I believe in miracles. I believe in signs and wonders. I will be lying to you today as a man of God. If I tell you those miracles have not played a role in the growth and what God has done in and through my life, it would be childish to begin to tell you the testimonies and the things that God has done.
Many of them will not even be believable. That is the truth. But all I can say is to him be the glory for the fearful things that he continues to do. Fearful indeed. Number three, and we'll pray. The third thing I see the devil attacking in the life of churches is their finances. I will end with this. Apostle, finances don't matter. Keep going. There's nothing I have to tell you. You just keep going. I assure you by God, keep going. One day, one day, Time does not change anything, but time reveals. Oh, time reveals. And time is such a brutal teacher. It can teach men a lot. You know, for a long time, this issue of money in the church, there are two sides to it. I'm, I'm working on borrowed time, so forgive me. We're not teaching finances here. Just have a few minutes and we'll pray. I hope I didn't waste your time. Please pay attention to this one. If you've been sleeping, wake up. God is speaking now. Can I tell you this? I have seen more people compromise. One time, God's servant, Bishop David Oedipo, was talking to us, and here's what he said. The last thing he said was, Beware of the God of gold. Shocking. Beware of the God of gold. Beware of the God of gold. I had that and it dropped my spirit. I have seen finances lead people to leave their convictions. The lack of it. More preachers have compromised because of finances than any other thing. They may start in truth preachers of righteousness. Let rent bills start coming. Generator fuel, diesel starts coming. Payment of staff within the ministry. And then you find out that people continue to do all kinds of ungodly strategies. If you want to truly be a preacher of righteousness in this end time, can I tell you, you must obtain grace and wisdom from God to sort your finances, both personal and ministerial. Because if ministerial is solved and your own personal one is not solved, you are not entirely free. I have, listen, I have counseled people by the grace of God who told me, Apostle, I can't even pray again. Where did the attack come from? Finances. Do you know what it means for a man to come and be preaching perhaps multiple services and as he's preaching, the text coming in his phone is his landlord. Just finish and wait for me. He will come and meet me there. And if for any reason, maybe he wants to check his scripture. I know you are laughing, but there are some of you who know what this means. I know a man of God whose wife refused that she was not going to be following him again for, for service. You, you can imagine what that does to the church. Because of the sheer anger. Why would God keep failing us like this as a family? Is he alive? Jesus did not keep quiet over the issue of finances. He paid attention to the financial needs of the people. He showed that he cared for the welfare of people. Because after preaching and doing everything, he said, don't leave them to go that way. Please give them something to eat. They said, we don't have enough. He said, I will do something about it. But the people should eat. They should not only hear and eat the spiritual meal. God cares about our welfare. He cares about our well-being. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound towards us, the Bible says, so that we, having... All sufficiency in all things, the Bible says. There is a relationship between all sufficiency and good works. If you do not have all sufficiency, there is a limitation to the good works that you can do. Many years ago, sir, we went for a crusade. Preach my heart out and preach Jesus. But we did not have money for the transport of the people back. We didn't have money to pay for where we stayed and we didn't have money to pay for the, the bus that was going to take the people back to Zaria at that time. I had to tell them, just go. True story. We negotiated with the people to go and wait somewhere in Zaria 
I told them by the time the bus is getting there, after maybe about six hours of the journey, your money will be waiting for you there. Everybody went after a powerful crusade. Miracles and Jesus was glorified. But this finance thing, the sound people who we rented sound from, at the time, it was 150,000. It looks small now. But my brother, 150,000, even now, it's not like it's exactly so small. <laughs> Can I tell you this? Do you know what it means for a preacher who stood and shouted for hours about a supernatural God? Now you are standing with the sound guys that came all the way from Kaduna to that place. You shouted about the supernatural God. They were setting that sound in the crusade. They saw the sick people healed. You dressed in suit and you finished everything. And now they are gone and the people say, please, our money. Where is that God who sent you? He could open a blind eye and he could not give us our 150,000. This your God has something. Which one is easier? To open a blind eye to heal a crippled man or to give you 150,000? And you see, at that point, no, I'm, I'm not sharing this. It's past. It's an old story. But I stood there wondering, God, but what is this? This is not fair. I had to write an agreement with them. God is my witness. I had to go around and look for someone to help me with 20,000 to give them. I said, just go. There are times that you lock the door, you are not praying. You are just walking around. Shaliskede baraskuba haskadiya bagatosi. And you are just sitting there. And the next time you are, you are on the window. Lord, we need 200 million for this building. Lord, we need 10 million or whatever for this bus. And yet you have a conference to preach in. And you have, a, have eight sermons to come. And then your child comes with PTA letter. And you see that PTA letter, you almost will call it an evil report. Because of what was written there. Oh, because of the pandemic and the times we have increased the school fees. Everything has increased except your finances. And you are there. Can I be honest with you? That's when Satan comes. What he told you 10 years ago and he said, God forbid, I will not do it. He will come again. Satan is a master at maximizing desperation. He will come to you. You are a lady and you said, I will not compromise. I will live for Jesus. Until everybody calls you and says... I don't know this your thing you are doing. I don't know the name of what you are doing with God. And some unbeliever guy will come and tell you, listen, I'm not born again, no. I don't fear God, but I have money. He said, oh no, God forbid, it's not you I'm talking about. After five years, by yourself, you won't know when you will carry your phone and say good afternoon. If we don't teach the church this aspect, we will keep losing our precious people. The devil will wait for us to prepare precious people. And the devil will come and just carry them using the God of gold. I'm wrapping up. Let me show you something. Genesis 42, verse 1 and 2. It's a new season. It's a new season. When Jacob saw that there was corn, where? The location is wrong, but the supply is correct. I have a problem with the location, but I need corn. There is nothing wrong with the corn. The problem is where to get it. Egypt. Jacob said unto his sons, Why do we look upon one another? Verse 2. This is a prophet speaking. A man of God without corn. Behold, I have heard that there is corn in a wrong location. But there is nothing we can do. Get up and go thither and buy for us from there. Why? So that we may live and not die. The only thing that takes Israel to Egypt is hunger. Hunger. When there is hunger, even if you are a prophet, you will find your way to Egypt. Could that be why many men of God who started well, unreasonable associations you never would have been
Are you ready for me to take you to go and see that politician or not? And he said, let me pray about it. Go and read about Balaam. They kept coming, they kept coming. Then they brought noble men and gifts. And he said, wait, don't go back. What did you say? Let me try. He used divination. How can I call on your name and then the finish? No way. No way. No way. After that encounter, I vowed and I made up my mind that everything needed to excel in ministry, I will learn. I said, Lord, I'm not ashamed. Until that time, I came from a background that did not seem to pay attention to these things. We were obedient to what we were taught. Fire, hunger, encounters, the Holy Spirit. We were having visionary encounters, heavenly encounters, miracles. Can I tell you this? A time came in my life when those my people who I could not pay for the, the services we used, they told me they were going to come and send police to come and arrest me and go and jail me. I said, Lord, am I going, did I kill anybody? At that time, today I'm laughing, but then I think the, one of the times in my life I can tell you I was shaken to the core. Then I was, waiting for my, I was waiting for my scholarship so that I would use part of it. Because all of my scholarships were dedicated for the gospel. And I was waiting for it. The thing didn't come. I knew I was in trouble. Can I tell you this? By the privilege of God's grace, one of the reasons today while we stand and continue to teach truth, I will not lie to you, is because God has shown us mercy even in this area. If I have needs, probably by now I would have compromised. Preachers, we must be honest with one another. Let's not tell one another lies. By the grace of God today, if I sit down and there is, I, I know there is nothing to eat, and I have the prophetic, I can see your account number. You are joking. You think I'll keep quiet? just be condemning people and telling people walk in righteousness give them the tools that support righteousness provide them the tools don't tell the lady stop following bad men her mother is dying in the village there are 11 children none of them went to school she was the first person to stand and she feels i don't have anything except a beautiful face since beauty took esther to the palace let me try my own chance and say, leave that thing and focus on God. And then Mama calls from the village and says, so this is how I'm going to die with 11 children. And the lady says, I will do anything. I don't care. See, I, I did not start ministering to adults. I started ministering among young people. By the privilege of God's grace, I can tell you I know a bit as to why many people don't stay with God. When the needs that overwhelm them Many of the people that I had the privilege to lead were either raised by single moms or were raised by um, some person somewhere or some freelance people moving around. Don't just condemn people and say you are an unserious person. Find out sometimes the motivation. We have to do something about this issue of finances. Even for preachers. When preachers run around politicians and compromise. Sometimes, some of them are not serious with God. But some are very serious with God. It's just that this thing has pinned them to the neck. When a man of God lifts up a song of worship and rain comes. Because there is no covering to where they rented. And drenches everyone. And the man of God stands and feels irresponsible. And says, there is someone I know who does not love God. I can go and bow to him and coerce with him and he will give me something. 
Righteousness is supported by provisions. There has to be provisions. Satan is fighting the economy of the church. The balance is that we must not just teach people about money blindly. We must teach people prosperity as a tool to kingdom advance. When we do not create that balance, we fuel lost in people. So even people who are not serious with God like what we are teaching because it supports the lost in their heart. We must help people love Jesus and find Jesus. I have been treated so graciously by your pastor and the entire house on the rock. And I just, from, from, from the airport, even up to this place, I was just thinking, I can only imagine how much was spent in this conference. And I'm saying it sincerely. I would be stupid to just assume nothing happened with all of this, this love and this honor. You know how much it takes to fuel a crusade? Many of you here do crusades. Have you seen a preacher angry on the final day of the crusade? Because of the memory. We're about to pray. I'm giving you a prayer point already. Must we allow our families to be destroyed on the altar of compromise? Simply because of all of this. I don't know about you, but Enugu, as for me and my house, we will not only serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord truthfully, but we will embrace the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. God is a provider. God can make a way. God can bless people. Please rise up on your feet. Thank you for giving me this allowance. I want to pray for you as we prepare for the miracle service in the evening. Hosting God also means hosting the whole counsel of God. The Lord has taught us a number of things in this service. The reality of the divine life that is at work in us that can help us to be fruitful or wise the reality of our oneness with Christ. And I didn't have the time to teach you about our positional advantage. The Bible not only says we have been raised up, but it says we have been made to sit. There is a throne that we sit upon. Far above principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, every name that is named, not only in this life, but even in the dispensation to come, the Bible declares. And now I shared with you the three major areas where the devil is attacking the church. Satan is attacking membership. Let me tell you this. Satan is attacking membership. There are still about 7.6 billion people on earth. And as far as I know, the last time I checked, there are about 2.6 professing Christians. That includes those who are backsliding, those who are not talking of authentic Christians. Just those who name the name of Christ. 2.6 and we want Jesus to return there is still a harvest if every church is filled to capacity we will not scratch one hundredth of the souls that still need to be saved and then we need signs and wonders please hear me tonight as you are coming don't only come inviting others come with your heart enlarged because I'm going to be teaching for a short time tonight. And it's not only miracles that will happen tonight. But I trust God that there will be a solid impartation. This transference of grace. That it will come upon you. Not only in ministry. In the different areas. Paul said, I long to see you. That I may impart upon you some spiritual gift." To the end that ye might be established. God has shown us mercy by the privilege of His grace. There is nothing exceptional in our lives. Our sufficiency is of God, who indeed has made us able ministers of the New Testament. After the Spirit and not after the letter, for the letter killeth, it is the Spirit that gives life. Let your heart be prepared tonight. You have tabernacled all through this conference. Open up your heart. 
for all the sessions left. But for now, please lend me two or three minutes as you pray passionately. You're going to ask the Lord to plant in you a consciousness of your divinity. The fact that God lives in you through His Spirit. The implication of your oneness with Christ. Open your mouth and sincerely pray. Lord, plant in me. I am tired of ordinary living. I am tired of living like a natural man. There is an implication to my being saved. I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Now listen. Pray if you are a pastor here or you are a man of God or you are a leader in your own organization. You are going to pray. Lord, you are a God of increase. Luke 5, Luke 2, 52. Jesus increased. That means God increases people. You are going to pray for increase. Increase. That you will increase my greatness and even comfort me round about. Jesus himself increased. You are going to pray for increase. Lord, send souls. Add daily as many who should be saved. I pray that there will be no empty pews and empty seats in the church that you have given me still worship over. Send as many who should be saved. Send as many who should be healed. Send as many who should be delivered. Is someone praying? Please lift your voice and pray. Lift your voice and pray. Pray for church growth. Pray for church growth. Pray for the body of Christ in Enugu State. Pray for House on the Rock, Enugu. Pray for the assembly that you pastor. The organization that you lead. Lord, bring increase. In the multitude of men is a king's honor. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of them that published it. Restore the days of the generals, O God. Where multitudes, multitudes will come to hear and to see. Where multitudes will come to hear and to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are going to pray for your finances. The issue of signs and wonders will settle that in the night. But I'd like you to pray. When it has to do with finances, please listen to me. There are two elements that are involved when it has to do with finances. There is the understanding that you need to have. Because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15, He says, good understanding procures favor. He says, but the way of the transgressor is hard. You need good understanding. You need to understand finances. Most people in church don't educate their minds. They sit down in superstitious belief systems, hoping that somehow they will be blessed. There is a technology to wealth as far as the cosmos is concerned. And we must submit ourselves to knowledge. There are people who have documented this knowledge. When the people were in lack, the parable of the ten virgins, this was the advice. Go to them that sell and buy. Not everyone is in need. There are people who not only have, they also sell. Go to them that sell and buy. He says, buy the truth. You need to settle down and find out from the life of people who have been successful from the perspective of the kingdom. Not circumstantial wealth. Not up today and down tomorrow. Stability through understanding. And then, in addition to that background, the empowerment of the Spirit. It is true that the Holy Spirit is able to prosper people. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. He says, for it is He that giveth thee power. There is such a thing called power to prosper. Capacity that empowers you. Most times in the church we focus on the power to prosper. I have taught you, if it's profit you are looking for, it is oil plus a lot of vessel. You don't need a lot of oil. Just get the vessel. The oil will multiply to match the vessel. If your understanding is small, even if it's a great anointing on you, you will still be begging. It is a large capacity 
plus oil that equals profit. If you have oil with no profit, the problem is not oil. The problem is vessels. Most of us may have oil, but even if you do not, I can tell you in this conference, there are those that sell. Go to them that sell and buy. You buy with meekness. You buy with humility. Humility is currency. Honor is currency. Meekness is currency. You can use it to buy oil so that your lamp will come back aflame again. So please prepare your heart for tonight. I apologize. I've stretched you. I've taken your time. This will not always happen, but I believe that this is worth the while for your destiny. If I were you, between now and when the night will start, I would take a few minutes and pray and say, Lord, give me a destiny-altering encounter for good tonight. Let me not just come and share the grace. My heart is open. Teach me your ways. So that after this conference, it will truly be that you are hosting God in experience alongside everything associated with God. I pray for you. May the Lord bless you. In the name of Jesus. You have labored here to endure sound doctrine this morning. I decree and declare. That as we... Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.